This week on episode 270, we're talking about Crew 4. It's launch on April 23rd. James Webb Space Telescope's update. I got to ask a question of the scientists and engineers. I'll share with you. Space launch systems, wet dress rehearsal got delayed. What does this mean for Artemis 1? Let's talk about it. Thanks for joining us. Hello and welcome to Today in Space. My name is Alex Girofanos, your space science podcast host from the East Coast. And we're back for another episode of the podcast, the All Things Space Science Podcast. Uh, welcome, everybody. Episode 270. And we've got a lot of things to cover from some really important space events that happened earlier this month that we'll cover. And if you want to follow along for any of that stuff and tap into the podcast on a daily basis, the best way to do that is to go to our Instagram page for the In Space Pod. Follow us over there. And you can really tap into what's going on in space on a daily basis. This podcast kind of compiles some of the most important or the things that I feel like uh, if you'd like to jump in and follow along on what's what's the most relevant thing right now, that's what we try and talk about here. It's, it's all things space because we, we talk to people with a bunch of different backgrounds, people of science from all aspects of life, from all different backgrounds. We have those types of episodes. We have episodes like these where we'll discuss the latest stuff that's going on in space. So if you want to know where what's actually happening today in space, you'll actually be able to find out. And then we do other episodes where we'll dive into topics, like one we're working on very soon is, you know, what is an astronaut in today's world? You know, what is what was an astronaut in the original sense of the word and in today's world where we have Jeff Bezos launching celebrities to the edge of space, uh, what are all the different variations of astronauts and of course i owe the listeners of this podcast we talked about earlier this year uh discussing you know if i went to space what would be the mission that i would want to be a part of because after the inspiration for mission that happened with spacex uh not that long ago uh, the first all civilian mission uh to space and 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 in orbit uh out farther than the international space station in orbit in, in altitude um really made me rethink uh, about what it what it would mean if if any of us got that opportunity there's only so so many of us that have ever gone to space uh hundreds right and what would you do what would be your mission right what what would you want to accomplish while you have that very limited and very valuable time in orbit what would you do where would you want to go? Would you want to go to the space station? Would you want to go to Mars? Would you want to go to the moon? Anywhere in between and outside. That's an episode we'll do here soon. So that is a big, round, circular, uh, word-intensive way of me saying welcome to today in space. Uh, it's good to have you here. So we're going to talk about Apollo 13. We're going to talk about Yuri's Night. Uh, and we're going to talk about STS-1 because those historical dates just happened recently earlier this month. Uh, we've got a James Webb Space Telescope update. And I have a clip from me joining on the uh, Twitter spaces that NASA held for that. I got to ask a question, so I get to share that with you guys here. And then we've got to talk about NASA's SLS, the wet dress rehearsal. We're really excited about it last episode. Rolling to the pad for the first time ever. Putting the Space Launch System on display and, and getting out to the pad and getting that wet dress rehearsal, which we'll discuss what that means in a little bit here, uh, had some complications. And now there was a, a media briefing yesterday, actually. this We're recording this on April 19th. So that was April 18th. And that was also something I got to listen in on. So I've got some things to share with you. And if you are planning on going to Florida, like we are, for the Artemis 1 mission, uh, there's, there's some timelines to look into. So I've got some dates for you guys to keep in mind, there's nothing set in stone. NASA still has to bring a uh, rocket back to fix it and then get it back out there. Uh, but we'll go over into all of that stuff. And then, of course, we have an update uh, from our 3D printing lab, AG3D, which funds this podcast. Uh, so we will go into that very, very shortly. So thanks for joining us. Let's dive in. All right, up first, we've got to talk about the dates that happened recently today in space. These are historical dates, dates that uh, that really set a tone for the entire industry. You know, they're, they're historic, right? So on April 12th, uh, that was STS-1, the first space, sh space shuttle launch. Uh, 
Columbia. Uh, astronauts Young and Crippen, they flew into space, spent over 50, well, they spent 54.5 hours in space before landing safely on the runway. And, you know, the space shuttle, we said it in the post, it was an incredible program. It was so iconic. Uh, the space shuttle is one of the reasons why I got into aerospace engineering. Once I learned that there was a way for a normal person from a small town in Massachusetts to potentially uh, work on the space shuttle, I mean, that that was like, hey, sign me up for that. That That's literally, the space shuttle is such a huge part of my origin story uh, for even being on this podcast talking to you today. So um, that was really cool. We, we saw, we shared some footage from uh, from NASA that was really cool. Um, now in history, the first private mission to the International Space Station, Axiom 1, arrived at the space station. Uh, this was on April 9th. Uh, so they launched in a Falcon 9 Crew Dragon capsule and made it to the International Space Station for astronauts, private astronauts, um, not actually assigned to the ISS for any missions, but they were up there and they had their own missions that, and they were spending that time uh, doing what astronauts do in space. And this is that first Axiom is a company that wants to launch these private missions to the International Space Station and wherever else they can launch people. Um, and so this is this is really cool stuff to see the the logo on a SpaceX Crew Dragon. It just goes to show you the the full spectrum of possibilities that are that are available now in space when you have a company like SpaceX that can offer out their spacecraft to paying customers. Uh, it doesn't just have to be NASA. It doesn't just have to be SpaceX. It can be all these other companies uh, that can then build an entire industry in a space economy. We've talked about that in other episodes of the podcast. And of course, we want to talk to more people about that more because that is something that is becoming more of a reality as we do more things in space there will be a reason to send things into space uh, more scientific opportunities business opportunities to expand on that so axiom one crew is now spending a little bit more time uh, due to the weather on return so sadly sadly they have to spend more time on the space station <laughs> than their original 10-day mission but i'm sure i'm sure they'll be just fine <laughs> and enjoy themselves in the process next up on that same day april 12th is also uh, Yuri's night. It's the, and that's part of the reason why STS one was planned for April 12th, because on April 12th, 1961, Yuri Gagarin became the first human being to go into space. And he flew on the Vostok one mission on a Soyuz and became that first person to go to space before that, before Yuri, Yuri Gagarin and the other astronauts that followed, they had some crazy, crazy theories about what happens to human beings when they go into space. Like, do do their eyes fall out of their sockets? All these crazy things that we were worried about that you just don't know until you send somebody up there. Um, and, of course, that changed the game. And, and then to have on, what is this now? How many years after for, yeah, 20 years after Yuri Gagarin was the first launch of STS-1. And the fact that they pulled that off, the timing, the launch windows, to have that first mission go and launch on that date is uh, historic. So we wanted to make sure we brought that up. Uh, and then, of course, that same week um, is when the Apollo 13 mission happened. So April is a very, very busy month for space. In the summer months, really, they... They uh, some of the busiest historically uh, part of that is launch windows. Part of that is um, just the timing of when space activities happen, uh, especially uh, when a lot of these dates are based around U.S. dates and whatever can happen in Florida and those launch dates. So that's that's some of the history there that we want to keep you updated on. And that's what's been happening today in space. All right. Next up is some orbital news. So there is a launch slated very soon. The next private well the next mission it's uh, the crew 4 mission so this is a nasa mission uh to send astronauts to the international space station the crew missions have replaced the missions that we used to send astronauts aboard the soyuz system uh with uh, russian cosmonauts and we used that system to go back and forth from earth to the international space station since the space shuttle was retired in 2011 until very recently when the u.s regained its ability to launch its own humans from its own spacecraft on its own soil. And that only happened during the pandemic. That was the first time we were able to accomplish that. Um, so for basically a decade, we used that Soyuz system. This is the fourth mission, Crew 4, of the official missions to send 
astronauts to the International Space Station. And there are four astronauts that are on board. It's slated to launch no earlier than, so if you see NET with a launch date for anything space related, it's no earlier than because with space, there's launch windows. Uh, if you've ever been to a launch, you'll experience this, but if I can save you, <laughs> if I could save you the horror now, um, launches get delayed all the time. And that's just how it is because if you don't delay and you try to rush it and launch quickly, you have what happened with the spatial disasters. You have uh, too much room for failure and you do not want to risk people's lives. So as as much as it might be frustrating to wait for these missions to, to line up with our own schedules and that makes it very difficult to travel to and spend time, I hear you, believe me, living on the Upper East Coast here, but um, that is the name of the game if we want people to go into space safely. So uh, no earlier than April 23rd. Uh, so this crew of four is going to be up early that day. If everything goes well, they will be up early that day getting ready, uh, getting suited up, driving down to the pad uh, where the rocket will be um, at 39A, historic launch complex, complex 39A at uh, NASA Kennedy Space Center in Florida. Uh, the Falcon 9 rocket has been previously flown uh, it'll be this will be its fourth mission, so it's been reused, and uh, previously supported CRS-22, which was a resupply mission, Crew-3, which was the the very last mission that launched uh, astronauts to the International Space Station for this, and uh, TurkSat-5B, so it was a mission delivering a satellite into orbit, and this will be the first for the commercial crew program for a fourth flight booster. So it's also historic. Even the thing launching it up there is historic right now. So, um, And then the SpaceX Crew Dragon, um, which has the capacity to bring up to seven people, will be bringing four astronauts up there. Those four astronauts are ast uh, the commander, Gajal Lengren, um, hometown Taipei, Taiwan, previous missions, Expedition 44 and 45 on the International Space Station. Bob Hines will be the pilot. His hometown town is Fayetteville, North Carolina. This is his first mission. He's a rookie, so um, that's going to be really, really exciting. Uh, the mission specialist is Jessica Watkins. Her hometown is Lafayette, Colorado, born in, I need to make sure I said that right, Gatesburg, Maryland. This is also her first mission. So we've got two rookies going up with two veterans. The other f final crew member, mission specialist, astronaut Samantha Cristoforetti, from the European Space Agency. Her hometown is Milan, Italy, and her previous missions were expedition 42 and 43 and um you know if you were one of those people following the international space station missions from 2011 until more, more recently before the spacex crew dragon capsule um you probably have seen both of these astronauts samantha christopher Reddy. she's very famous for her photo uh, dressed up as captain janeway drinking coffee in space out of the cupola of the iss and uh Kajel lindgren um i don't know i i remember following him on expedition 44 uh, that was around the time when I was really following astronauts, and I just really enjoyed the content he was putting out there. I really enjoyed how he was communicating what he was doing up there. So I'm looking forward to see um, more more from him. And the uh, so we're really looking forward to that. It's nice to have these missions take over from from what we used to do with the Soyuz, which was to send up you know multi crew like bring opportunities. The you know the European Space Agency doesn't have a crew capsule to send their own astronauts into the astronauts, International Space Station. So to be able to get them seats on board the capsule as we go up there, I mean, this just continues that international partnership on the station that's been around for many, many decades and continues to this day continuously with human presence. So we really, really look forward to this mission again, April 23rd for now. And we'll keep you updated on Instagram at Today in Space Pod and Facebook at Today in Space Podcast, our page there. You can follow along and we'll give you updates as that mission comes around the corner. But that's what we're looking at for right now. And we wish the crew and all the SpaceX team and NASA team on board uh, that'll be getting that rocket and spacecraft up to the ISS. Next, we've got to talk about James Webb Space Telescope. So, uh, for those who are brand new, James Webb Space Telescope is the successor of the Hubble Space Telescope. And the big advantage of James Webb Space Telescope is that it was designed to look as far back into the existence of 
of light in the universe, the very first galaxies that for, formed, the very first moments of light accumulating after the universe had the Big Bang and expanded into nothingness and darkness, and then as proto matter and things started to assemble themselves in the nothingness of space, uh, what did those first galaxies look like? What did those first stars look like? How did how did things form? We know after, we know before. We've got some data for that, but we don't actually know how things evolve. So that's how far back James Webb Space Telescope will be able to look. And it'll also be able to dive deeper, uh, metaphorically, into exoplanets and to observe with even uh, higher precision and with much better, I guess, eyes as to whether any of these exoplanets host life or if we can see any kind of signs of life. Um, we'll be able to get a much better picture of what these planets are. So... It, James Webb Space Telescope allows us to do so much. And a big part of what James Webb Space Telescope, how that's able to do that is because it's able, and what they've been working on right now, is getting James Webb Space Telescope, especially the MIRI instrument that they have on board, to cryo-cool temperatures. Uh, so about as cold as matter can get, as, as much as our, our human capability is to do that, um, recently, James Webb Space Telescope ha is achieving that currently so uh the team went on to twitter and did a twitter spaces and they they gave kind of a quick update of what's going on they had scientists they had engineers on the mission and they were helping to explain where everything is and answering questions and i actually had the chance to ask a question that was really cool i just requested it and i'm just sitting there in, in the ag 3d lab working on some 3d printing stuff and I was like, oh, this is great. Uh, let me request it. And then, boom, I'm on. And that's literally what we're going to play for you right now. Audience question. Um, Alex G. Orfanos or El Greco. Uh, let's see if we can bring you up to ask a question. Hi. Yeah, thank you so much for, for taking the question, um, Alex, from uh, Today in Space podcast. I was um, – you guys got me thinking about the, the, the cooling system. And I, I, it's kind of a multifaceted question. Um, First of all, are there any systems implemented that help regulate the thermal control once you guys get it that cold? And are there any uh, observations that might be heat heavy that you might need to take a break to cool back down afterwards? Thank you. Ah, thank you so much for that question. Um, Constantine, do you want to start off? Uh, sure. Um, the answer is uh, yes, we are counting on uh, on some events where we do have uh, higher uh, heat dissipation in the instrument. And there will be some, uh, and, uh, and perhaps Macarena can describe some of those, uh, some anneals that, uh, that will, be, uh, will be performed periodically. Uh, but uh, um, the, the uh, cryocooler does indeed uh, control its temperature. Um, it's done actually quite efficiently uh, in, in our case. Uh, um, there, are, there are a couple of ways to do that. One is uh, to modulate uh, the amount of cooling that the, that the cryocooler produces. The other one is uh, to do make-up heat, to have some heaters uh, at the place where uh, where you have either uh, detectors or, or instrument. And actually, uh, MIRI system overall uh, uses both of those. Uh, so on the cryocooler side, uh, we modulate uh, our, how much cooling we are producing so that, that at the interface with the instrument, we maintain the temperature. And then internally within the MIRI uh, instrument detectors uh, or uh, detector arrays, uh, uh, there are some additional heaters there that make up heat uh, for variation that is happening on shorter time scales. But yes, uh, we we are certainly temperature controlling, and I, I, it's uh, it's quite important. Uh, and uh, and with that, I think Makarena can uh, can describe a little bit more on on anneals. Yeah, totally. Thanks, Constantine. So anneals um, annealing is a process where it, of heating up the detector. So essentially, when MIRI is doing cycle one observations and observations to the sky, it will go constantly, will be looking at the sky and receiving photons. So those photons uh, will potentially leave latent or persistence that is like ghost images, if you will, of what was there uh, before. So one way of getting, eliminate all those residuals is actually to heat up the detectors to about 20 plus, almost 30 K, so significantly hotter than they are normally. And that process sort of cleans them up and then they are slowly bring back to cool down and, and they come back to their operating temperature below 7K. And after that process, uh, 
they really, at least what we've seen in the laboratory, we had to, to test all these things, of course, they really are clean and ready to take observations. And it's a process that takes, for the three detectors, about half an hour. So we will have to decide when to do it and how to do it. But uh, yeah, it's, it's a very powerful in the sense that it really leaves the detectors ready to take uh, clean science. So I just have to thank NASA for, for doing that. I thought that was really cool. That was my first time really engaging with something like that. And I'm going to try and do it more, uh, especially if that means we could put it up as content here later. The beautiful thing about the public public domain nature of, of NASA. So back to Miri. So so let's, let's talk a little bit about Miri real quick. I'm going to read from the jwst.nasa.gov page about this instrument. So Miri is one of the instruments on board. And it'll observe the red shifted light of distant galaxies, newly forming stars, and faintly visible comets as well as objects in the Kuiper belt, out, uh, Kuiper belt, out in the third zone of the solar system, um, the deep dark third zone, uh, where Pluto and other um, orbiting bodies from you know the the debris left over from the initial creation of the solar system, and possibly in Pluto's case. Planets that get scooped up into our gravitational well end up out there. Um, regardless, Miri is going to be able to allow us to observe uh, many things where visible light is very, very difficult uh, to capture. Um, so the mid-infrared instrument, uh, Miri, has both a camera and a spectrograph that sees light in the mid-infrared region of the electromagnetic spectrum with wavelengths that are no longer than our eyes see. Uh, Miri covers the wavelength range of 5 to 28 microns, and its sensitive detectors will allow it to see the redshifted light of galaxies, um, as we just said. <laughs> It'll provide a wide field broadband, uh, broadband imaging that will continue the breathtaking astrophotography that has made Hubble so universally admired. The spectrograph will enable medium resolution spectroscopy providing new physical details of the distant objects it will observe. So um, we've there's a lot of info. We'll add this article there. But thank you again, NASA team, uh, both Constantine and Macarena, for, for adding on to that. And um, I, I, I love asking questions to smart people, <laughs> especially the NASA folks. Um, they're, always, they're always willing to answer. So uh, as best they can, right? I mean, I thought it was really cool that, you know, as... James Webb Space Telescope gets used, we're kind of leaving like an imprint after everything that we look at. And so since it's so cold, the heat from that light is like leaving a mark. So the best way to do that, and my thought, my first thought was, do you have to cool that? Um, but it's actually heating that, that actually evens out the image. So I thought that was really cool. I was like, oh, okay. Like the heat problem is, is very deep, very something you can deal with with the observation. So it's, it, it seems like the challenge really is getting this spacecraft to the temperature. And at that point, it's a lot easier to manage. So it's done all the hard work at this point, James Webb Space Telescope, getting assembled mid, mid flight to uh, its place in orbit at uh, Lagrange point, point two. And here we are, here we are. So that's what we have for James Webb Space Telescope. And next, we're going to jump into Space Launch System, talk about wet dress and well, what all that means and what that's going to impact for, uh, for schedules and getting, uh, getting our butts down there to watch that, that first launch. So, wet dress rehearsal for the Space Launch System is when they first bring the spacecraft out there, right? So this, this spacecraft has been in design for a very long time. They have assembled it for the first test they rolled it out to the launch pad and they were having some issues with they weren't getting the numbers that they wanted to as they were calibrating the machine because they the wet dress rehearsal means that you have to load all of the propellant on board and get it basically ready to launch, but then unload it and put the rocket back safely into the vehicle assembly building. So that then you can build it to flight readiness after you've learned what you've, you know, you've checked all the valves. You make sure that they stay closed when they're supposed to stay closed. And when they're on, they give you the right pressure or, or, or volume of fuel that you need, especially in NASA's case. And apparently there was uh, just some work. Uh, so to 
preface this, uh, yesterday on April 19th, there was a media uh, conference call. We can have that link in here for you if you want to listen to the whole thing. But it was the SLS team uh, discussing how the mission is going, how Artemis 1 is getting getting prepared. And of course, um, wet dress rehearsal was expected to have uh, happened already. And then we would have been moving towards launching uh, potentially no earlier than June 6th. But now with this valve needing to get replaced by the, uh, the manufacturer that provides that valve, um, that means that the the SLS has to go back to the VAB. And so now the question is, how many times does that, does that have to happen? How many things can be fixed and how many different how many different scenarios are they going to need to plan for? Um, and, and people in charge, they were discussing different schedules, but a, a lot of it was in play yesterday and potentially today we were supposed to find out what the next plan is. But if I had to guess, and again, this is a guess, I think that the SLS will come back from, um, they'll, they'll fix the valve. They'll get the SLS back out there for the wet rehearsal. They'll load it. They'll test it. I'm sure whatever they fixed will work. Assuming that works, um, the rocket needs to come back to the vehicle assembly building and then get updated for, for flight readiness for Artemis 1, a few minor things that, that need to be there for that specific mission that maybe was a little risky or maybe just wasn't the time to test that. Um, so that's once that happens, it'll go back out to the pad for flight readiness and then we'll start seeing a launch date at that point. So I would guess that once the wet dress rehearsal is complete, that's when we'll actually get a date. Um, nothing was officially said during that media conference about when the actual Artemis 1 mission will happen or if we'll even need to delay. But given how long rollout takes and however long the fix is going to need to happen and then another rollout, um, that that could push us past the uh, the June date. So if that's the case, we actually were given two other windows in which the the Artemis 1 mission could happen. So the other two launch windows are June 29th to June 12th, uh, sorry, June 29th to July 12th and July 26th to August 9th. So basically, uh, we got to we got to plan this out in two week bursts. So um, if I had to bet my money on it, I was going to say I, I would say that June 29th to July 12th is most likely the 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 window that this is going to happen. Plenty of things can happen in between there, then and then. Um, I don't think NASA is going to be aggressive with the schedule. This you only get one Artemis one, right? So um, I I would say they're going to play it conservatively. They're going to play it lower risk, and that would probably take more time. So we end up in that end of June, beginning of July um, phase. So I'll be seeing you in Florida. <laughs> end of june into july um but yeah so we'll be keeping up with that um but our plan is to go down there um i am i am gathering all cosmic forces together to make this happen <laughs> so um we're really looking forward to that um and and it really is like it's amazing some of the stuff that's been happening like it's not just this valve right that that was an issue and i'm wondering what this next story has to do like how much it might be related to that valve and what issues may have been seen. But this is also a really like not a great weather time, right? The Florida is starting to get uh, stormier. Like I think it snowed uh, today in Florida. I think there was at least some frost. So this, there's some crazy weather going on just the East coast in general, but, but in Florida, definitely. And uh, in this article from the science times uh, uh, on April 3rd, 2022, uh, there was a report that there was on that Saturday, April 2nd, the uh, there were four lightning bolts, bolts that struck the launch pad. And luckily, there are towers surrounding the rocket for just this kind of thing. But you can imagine that having, <laughs> having lightning strike the launch pad is going to delay some things. So um, Mother Nature was definitely not playing nice uh, with, <laughs> with, with, with launch dates and, uh, and timelines. 
Um, and apparently, th- it, this was like a, a historical um, lightning bolt. I don't think... Let me see here. Let me see what this tweet says. So the first three lightning strikes were relatively low power events. However, the fourth blow, which struck the lightning protection system's Tower 1, was more powerful. Uh, As the NASA deputy manager of the Exploration Ground Systems, Jeremy Parsons, wrote on Twitter, the fourth strike was the strongest they've seen since the installation of the new lightning system. So the lightning system getting a good test for SLS. Um, it, It is crazy. I mean, they've upgraded it for better shielding against strikes. Um, better separate electrical current launch hardware and array sensors both on the ground and the mobile launcher that determines the rocket's condition after a lightning strikes. So they have all these systems that are that are checking to make sure that if something like this happens, uh, they've prepared for it and they can double check, check sensors against each other, see if there's any conflicting information or if they're also reporting the same thing, um, which is crazy. Um, and each tower has a fiber class fiberglass mast on top uh, and catenary wires that diverts the lightning from the mega rocket and its service structure so uh, all of that hard work and thinking and and redundancies that nasa is so good at saving the sls (laughs) on its on its debut out into the real world and uh and mother nature put on a show and hopefully um that valve will get swapped out pretty quickly uh apparently it's an issue that that was not a new issue to them. And it's just, you know, we just need to actually do the installation, which may require a little extra time. We wish them well fixing that. They sounded very positive about how the team is and troubleshooting and dealing with problems. You know, that's what you want with a good crew for missions like this, especially deep space human missions that, that Artemis three will end up doing, sending the first woman and the next person of color uh, to step foot on the moon. That, is really important to have a team that's that's ready to troubleshoot and take any challenge that comes their way as strange as it might be to have the the largest <laughs> lightning strike uh that the lightning protection system has seen in its current state uh, it's good f- to prep for the future and, and 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 get and get ready get those scientific logical tools sharpened uh in time for the for the big deal when we start putting humans on board so that closes up our episode this week thank you for joining us and uh for coming along for the ride we really appreciate it um before we end the episode we've got to talk about our 3d printing that we've been doing so if you're new to the podcast or just as a reminder this podcast is brought to you by ag 3d printing is our 3d printing lab where we bring ideas into reality we started it really early we uh bought a printer when i was a, a younger engineer um, built it uh, from a kit and really learned the ins and outs of the printer. And then I realized just how great of a tool it was for me to be like, hey, I've got this this thing I want to make the other day. Like, I didn't have a lathe. that Maybe I could make it out of wood, but how much work is that going to take? 3D printer helped me make all those crazy things I always thought of growing up. So um, it slowly became a business, and then it actually ended up funding this podcast. And, and getting the printer actually was an idea that came from this podcast. Um so it's a really cool thing that that the the lab also helps me as an engineer prototype, do some R and D, test new things, and play around and learn at my own pace. And it also helps fund this podcast and keep it going. So it's a, it's a really cool thing. We also do that to help others bring ideas into reality as well. Our friends at Snapcaller, that's uh, S N A P dash caller dot com. Uh, our friends over there use our 3D printing services to test out their first idea. And now they have uh, an actual product that they're selling where um, it's solving an age old problem of collars. You know, if you have a collared shirt after a while, it just kind of gets wrinkly and it's, you can iron it and, and you can try and do all those things, but it, it's just not a really elegant solution. And you never, whenever you need a collared shirt, it's always something that's last minute, right? You, you never think that your collar's not going to be ironed. And so how great would it be if you just, when you put it away, you set the collar and you just open it up when you're ready to use the shirt, especially if you're traveling, especially if you're uh, someone that needs to to dress up for work or have these things ready, you just throw that on there, you hang it, and then you, or you bring it with you wherever you're going and it's ready. It's good to go and you look sharp. So that's Snap Collar. Go check them out. Um, And that was an idea that we helped them bring 
bring to life. We helped get a real thing in their hands. So with AG3D, recently we've gotten a resin 3D printer, so we've been playing around with that. And we've got two space designs I want to show off. This one here is new, but it is not that new if you're familiar with the design, but this is our own model of the Fal Falcon 9, SpaceX's Falcon 9. As you can see, the quality will have a video of us actually printing it, but this resin technology really allows us to print super high de detailed things. And this is not by any means like um, the best print that we can do. And there's a lot of things that I learned from this, um, you know, little things that are, that are defects that I'm seeing now that I didn't understand when I was printing. Um, resin 3D printing, which is very different from this type of 3D printing, which is with uh, filament. This is our Starship design, but this was filament that was built on a surface and built upwards in layers. The resin printer actually builds it upside down. So this, the plate that you're building off of comes down into a vat of liquid and then uses UV light to cure, just like the James Webb Space Telescope uses when it when it's taking light in, it has to anneal to get that last image off. We're actually using that type of thing to cure um, UV resin into a shape. And then there are little supports that hang it, um, that keep it attached to the plate as it keeps going down and adding more and more layers. And so what I learned from this is that, you know, in this type of 3D printing where there's, I guess you could say it's chunkier, right? Like you're, you're, you're adding these 0.4 millimeter tool paths, right? And then if you have supports, they're just Sometimes it can get really stuck and sometimes it takes a lot of work and then to get it to the smoothness that you're looking for, there's a little bit extra labor on this. And <clears throat> so usually you're trying to minimize how much support that you use. And that's definitely the case for this, but support is so much more useful for setting the final image because if you don't have a support in this, the rest of the layer that you're trying to cure just kind of like sags and, and doesn't look that great. And so what I realized was with not enough supports, this thing kind of moves around as it's coming back down. And if it doesn't have something there to catch it, the, the liquid just moves as you're coming in and out of it. So um, cool, different, something new. Um, and just to show you what how much smaller we're able to achieve, this is, I don't even know if you guys will be able to see it. I think we have 4K, but... So this is the most intricate thing I think I've ever printed. Uh, if you're recognizing the shape, this is in the shape of James Webb Space Telescope. And we're using the same design that we've used for our James Webb Space Telescope coasters. Available right now on our Etsy shop, ag3dprinting.etsy.com. Um, you can pick one of these up and help support the podcast. Um, but with the resin printer, with how detailed it is, we really wanted to do something unique, um, something small, and uh, this is our first step at getting to that point. So um, the one thing I did learn about this is while supports are good, they shouldn't be stronger than your part. And you can see just how thin the like inner hexagons are. Uh, and that's way thinner than the support. So if I try and take this off, most likely I'm going to end up breaking one of those stems. But that'll be a test for later. And you'll be able to follow all of that progress, whether it's on Instagram at Today in Space Pod or at our Instagram with 3D printing at AG3D printing. And there you can see all the stuff we've done over the years, been around for a while. We've gotten a lot of hands-on experience helping others bring their ideas into reality. So if that's interesting to you, if you have a project you'd like to do, reach out to us. We've got free quotes, um, ag3d-printing.com, our Etsy shop, ag3dprinting.etsy.com. Uh, that's where you can get 3D printed products that we've already made, my own designs, things that are useful, good gifts, um, Lots of different stuff that we've got available and coming out soon. And, uh, of course, if you guys just want us to print anything cool, hit us up and we'll, we'll make that a post one day. So um, all of that helps us fund this podcast and more specifically and more um, more specific for the times is that's going to help us go down to Artemis 1, down to Florida to see that mission. Uh, so the more you guys can help support us, the more we'll be able to do down there. So I'm really looking forward to that. And I can't wait to share that with you guys. But in the meantime, we'll be here 
we'll be sharing more space, all things space, and science, and, and that's that's it, folks. Uh, be well, spread love and spread science, live long and prosper, and we'll see you on the next episode of Today in Space. See you later.